because a lot of people thought paper logs meant you could you know do more hours no that's wrong it, it, all you did was you did the hours differently and by that i mean you slept when you were tired you drove when you were awake which is not something the electronic log device mandate allows you to do Chicken trucking, big wheels there humming, high rate of fuel consumption, missing mama, needing love and rolling with a weight of sound. Running like a southern shaker, I don't need no 48 to turn this rig around. Welcome back to the Trucking Fitness Radio, the number one driver's health and fitness podcast in the world. My name is Dr. Mark Manera. I'm the founder and CEO of the Trucking Fitness Company, and I'm pumped to have you listening to this episode. As you're aware, we are on a mission to make the trucking industry a healthier place. And this is just one of the ways that we're doing that. And we're bringing on experts and drivers to tell their stories and hopefully spark some inspiration for drivers out there to say, hey, I can do this. And so today we've got an awesome guest on the show, Dean. He's a former driver and now he is at DAT as a principal analyst. Uh, but the reason why I wanted to get Dean on the show was he's a sleep expert. And uh, I want to talk about sleep because it's something that a lot of drivers struggle with. But let's get on with the show. Today, we are talking to Dean. Like I said, he is a former truck driver, actually from Australia. Um, but he was just at Matt's with his show truck, Grumpy Pete. Uh, but the real reason um, I wanted to speak with you, Dean, was because of your passion to help drivers sleep better on the mm. road. So, Dean, welcome to mm. the show. Yeah, great to be with you, Mark. Thank you for having me. It's a fascinating yeah. subject, sleep, lack, it is. That, lack thereof. It's, it's sort of a lack of sleep that we are more concerned about, but the science of sleep is a whole other world that I've been fortunate to study as a result of making a lot of mistakes as a driver. Um, I, I lost a couple of drivers on my watch running a truck company, fell asleep at the wheel, um, you know, and so you can lose your life within five seconds uh, from a microsleep event. So it's one of those... Um, you know, other than sleepwalking out of a moving vehicle, which apparently has happened um, in this country, in a motorhome, um, there are there's a there are not a lot of things that can be fatal from lack of sleep, um, but but one of them one of them of course is obstructive sleep apnea. You know, sleep apnea is a huge deal these days. Uh, my father was a trucker all of his life. He died of his second heart attack. Um, he had undiagnosed sleep apnea his entire work life and uh, self-medicated every single day with cigarettes and alcohol. And I see him everywhere I travel in the world. I see a lot of drivers struggling with self-medication. They don't know why they feel like they feel. They're tired, their eyes ache, their head hurts, they're depressed, they're moody, lethargic. And uh, when you get down to it, it's got a lot to do with sleep. Like either the physiology of the sleep is wrong or the, there are diseases of sleep. They're, they're two different components, right? And, and I, we could also get into the behavioral aspect of sleep. But the physiology of sleep is what I studied the most when I moved here. And, and how a lot of people ask me how I ended up here after doing a couple of million miles as a driver in Australia. After losing a couple of drivers, I ended up getting out of the trucking industry because I realized that I needed to make a life change. It was just too much of a traumatic event. Um, having to speak to you know spouses and children and and I it was kind of a by chance meeting of a Harvard professor I was speaking at an international conference on fatigue and transportation and and fatigue is completely the wrong word because we all know what fatigue is it's really sleep deprivation that's the big issue anyway I was talking on this subject on fatigue there's, there's all these global academics from all over all over the world in Perth Australia and after I stood up and spoke and shared some data about what really goes on on the road, he said to me, would you come to America and run my consulting business? And that was in 1999. And as a result of that, we moved to Boston, worked for Circadian Technologies, uh, did a lot of work designing 24-7 uh, workplace scheduling practices in a lot of industries, including trucking. But Mark, what I ended up doing after studying all of this sleep science and physiology with the Harvard professor I was sitting in an airport in Cleveland one day and I suddenly realized that what we've been doing is completely back to front when it comes to drivers. We teach them how to be compliant to hours of service. We assume that a 10 hour break means they'll be well rested for the next shift, but we don't teach them what to do, how to sleep on that 10 hour shift. We actually don't do that. So um, I've been an advocate that if we just regulated the hours of sleep we had and, and locked in a, a set sleep pattern, you wouldn't need to manage hours of service, you'll get much more safer outcomes. So what I started doing from that point on was I started doing sleep science workshops. 
So I've done over 700 sleep classes, hour and a half workshops on the physiology of sleep for truckers, wives, and their teenage children, because the spouse and the teenage children manage the sleep schedule at home, right? So it's, you know, in your business, when you teach drivers in, in uh, isolation of the family, it's very hard to get support and compliance. So we, uh, I've done all these sleep classes. It's arguably one of the most transformational things I've ever done in teaching drivers how to sleep. I've done it at all the major larger truckload carriers, uh, big companies like Praxair, CR England, uh, Dupre Logistics in, in Lafayette, Louisiana was one of my first big customers. Uh, so it's, it's, I've, I've spent a lot of time on this. So what really gets me motivated more than anything is helping drivers' um, days be a little bit better. And the way you do that is you learn how to sleep a little bit better because we're all different. A one, it's, we're not a one size fits all deal. Putting the hours of service over the top of every single driver's individual sleep personality is a recipe for disaster. And that's why the recent studies show that accidents have increased since the hours of service ELD mandate came in. If only someone told us that was going to happen, if only. And, and I say that tongue in cheek because that's exactly what I said before the ELD mandate came on on a webinar I did for Spirion uh, way back in 2017, because up until that point, I'd worked with telematics firms like Omnitrax and Qualcomm, and I'd been studying paper log firms since 2007, and I'd been comparing to them to e-log firms. I'd been comparing the, the accident rates of fleets that had paper logs versus e-logs. I guess which one's the safer? Take a wild guess. Uh, I'm going to, well, based off that, I'm going to say paper logs. Uh, yeah, well, a, yeah wow. a long way. Yeah. Wow. So they were about 30% safer. So wow. fleets that ran paper log and all the drivers out there will be saying, of course, we all know that because a lot of people thought paper logs meant you could, you know, do more hours. No, that's wrong. It, it, well, all you did was you did the hours differently. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, you slept when you were tired and you drove when you were awake which is not something the electronic log device mandate allows you to do. So, I mean, if you could have the flexibility of a paper log in the ELD mandate, you would be, you would be so much safer. In fact, to that, I put a, a, a sleep, um, I, look, I applied for an exemption with a consortium of carriers in 2005. The exemption was called hours of sleep. So it was a deliberate play on words. And what I wanted was, because I knew as a driver that running paper logs, if I could just sleep when I was tired, and drive when I was awake and make it add up to 11 and 10, 11 on, 10 off, I'd be fine. I could do plenty of miles. I'd be much safer, much happier, more rested, you know, more healthy. And the exemption was to simply allow drivers to put together the 11 hours on duty and the 10 hours off, however they wanted. At the end of the day, it adds up to 11, 10, and three, three other, 10 off, 11 on, with the, with the requirement that in the 10 hours off, you have to have six hours continuous because six hours is the very minimum you need to function normally as a truck driver, be alert and stay healthy. Anything six hours of sleep, six, correct? Yes, yeah, six hours okay. of continuous sleep. Well, six hours of sleep. If you get less than six hours sleep every 24, you're in a world of hurt. And I know some people say, well, I can get by on four hours sleep. No, you can't. That, that is not the case. There is something fundamentally wrong if you're getting, if you can get by on that sleep, you must be self-medicating, you're, you're drinking too much caffeine, all those things. Six hours is where the research shows you need to be. Um, and in your world, um, some of the studies that I've looked at show that if you get less than six hours sleep, you eat 550 more calories the next day. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And I, I've. I believe that's uh, because hormones, uh, stomach hormones and uh, digestion hormones right. cause you to yep. have more cravings, yep. have more, yeah, all those things. Um, well, the, the, the ghrelin, the ghrelin, which is the hormone yes. that says, you know, the, the one to eat changes and the leptin that tells you you're, you're full, you know, there's an imbalance, right? So, and carriers will know that because as you get sleep deprived, you, you gravitate to more comfort food. And in fact, even when you're dehydrated, you'll gravitate to more high water content carbohydrates. So it's a kind of a double whammy, right? People, people focus on the diet aspect of it in isolation of the sleep, but you really need both, right? You need to get the sleep right. And there's, I've learned a whole lot of things about how to sleep properly, um, having done overnight express work for years, taken stuff to stay awake, um, falling asleep at the wheel dozens of times every night. And, uh, and because in Australia, you're in the middle of nowhere, there's you know, chances of hitting something are fairly remote compared to some of our busy interstates. So I'm just lucky that I'm here. Yeah. I've, I've just been lucky that I never hit anything. 
but ran off the road a lot. So in my 2 million miles as an over the road driver, I probably remember about 70% of them. The others I've got no idea. And if a lot of drivers are honest with themselves, one of the first things that goes is short term working memory. When you get really tired, you start to forget things. And if you've forgotten the last exit mile marker, couple of hours of a trip, like that's the early signs of sleep deprivation. So memory is a is a your first giveaway. It's not the yawning or the head nodding. All that happens long, you know, way down the road. Yeah, no, I I, I completely agree. And before we kind of dive too deep into the sleep stuff, because I, I gotta ask, because mm-hmm. I always like to hear the the come up story a little bit. How did you go right. from a driver owning fleets to speaking at a conference in front of Harvard uh, professors? Yeah. So um, a good friend of mine who's on the fifth wheel of my truck as a monument, good friend of mine, John Kelly, um, had made that transition. He was doing consulting work for the Australian Trucking Association. Um, and he was in the process of writing the standards for what's known as Truck Safe. And Truck Safe is a self accreditation program they have in Australia where you can, be, you can get regulatory exemptions if you do self compliance. So it's you do driver health, driver medical, scheduling, weight management. So for example, if you do, if you have a vehicle maintenance program where you're doing self-accreditation and you're audited to over and above government regulation, so it's a high standard, you don't have to take your truck across the pit every year. Mm. Right? You can just submit your paperwork. So it's a much it's easier to get regulatory uh, exemptions if you can prove compliance through paperwork as opposed to a check once a day you know, once a year gotcha. on a day. Yeah. So TruckSafe was a fascinating program. JK uh, said to me, you know, when I was getting out of the industry, would you come and help us um, write the fatigue management section of this, the sleep scheduling piece. And so I ended up working as a consultant for the Australian Trucking Association. Long story short, I ended up being general manager of the Australian Trucking Association for two years at, straight out of the trucking industry, because it's all about, uh, you know, uh, lobbying, um, advocating for the industry, which I was deeply passionate about having grown up in the trucking business from a, you know, as a, in my father's livestock haulage business. So for, it was an easy transition for me to go into you know, being a lobbyist for the industry. But in the process, I was speaking at conferences for a company called Allianz, who was a large insurance company who were trying to understand why they had so many accidents and, and were losing, you know, money on the insurance side of things. And, and that's where I met at this international conference on fatigue, because here's, here's how I landed there. The data shows that in most trucking loss portfolios, accident portfolios, 80% of the cost comes from about 10% of the accidents. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the 10% of the accidents are guess what? Single vehicle lane departures, four degree drift from lane center. Why four degrees? The crown of the road to run water from the center to either side when you're in the hammer lane, for example. And if you fall asleep, the gravity is going to take you off at four degrees as the crown of the road pulls you to the left. Interesting. So that's why you see the runoffs in winter into the snow. If you're on the right, it'll you'll drift off to the right and hit a guardrail. So when you look at insurance claims loss runs, both drivers fell asleep in either lane. One is a wrecker for 800 bucks to pull it back onto the road. The other one is a hit guardrail for 1500. And this is why a lot of trucking companies struggle with this because they don't understand what caused the accidents because most insurance claims portfolios are coded by a description of what happened, not what caused it. So why is it coded a rollover? Well, how did you roll over? Well, what happens is you fall asleep, drift off the wheel. After about five seconds, your head nods. You wake up, overreact, sharp right hand down, roll over. Interesting. The difference between a runoff road and a wrecker and a rollover is like a couple of seconds. So that if you if you dig into this data, you will find that drivers are falling asleep a lot on the roads, a lot more than what they think. Some, and most of the time you don't remember because you're not designed to remember sleep. That, those chemicals shut down when you sleep to restore the brain. So you don't remember a lot of your micro sleeps. But, but Mark, the most scary thing I learned from this was that as you fall asleep, all of your muscles relax, right? That's the physiology you relax. So when you fall asleep driving a truck, eventually your neck muscles relax. So steering, your steering relaxes, your big arm muscles relax and you start to wander. Your leg muscles relax and your foot comes off the gas. That's why you never use cruise control because when you fall asleep, your foot comes off the gas. If you ever see people speeding up and slowing down on the interstate, they're going to sleep and waking up and going to sleep. So think about this big neck that I've got here and this massive bowling ball on my shoulders. When I 
fall asleep and that neck muscle eventually collapses. It takes about five seconds for the neck muscle to relax and collapse. And then my head rotates forward and then I wake up. So to, a, a nod, a head nod follows about a four to five second sleep, which is like two to 300 yards. So a micro sleep. So what most drivers think is the head nod was the sleep. No, it's the wake up. You've already been asleep. Uh, interesting. Right. So, interesting. so that's the, that's the physiology of micro sleep. So that's a really frightening because it could be a bridge abutment. It, you could be going across the median and hit a, hit a car load of people or a bus full of people going to church. You see these events every single week on our winter States. So that's, that's the physiology side of the sleep. And that's what goes on on the roads. That's what that's. So that's a long way of saying that's how I ended up here studying this because I was, I was shocked at how the physiology played out on our highways, how easy it was to spot this. And, uh, and it's, and it's hard for most companies because there's a liability angle to digging into this subject from the, you know, the, the punitive side, right? Because a lot of companies ban the word fatigue from their accident reporting. Because the litigation side, like the attorneys will come after them and try and allege some sort of, um, uh, you know, bad practices. And that was easy to do with paper logs. But so, so now if I'm compliant to unsafe regulations, i.e. the hours of service, if I'm compliant, it's very hard for an attorney to come at you and say you weren't compliant. That's what e-logs e do. So that's yeah. why the latest data shows that the ELD mandate has increased compliance, but it's made fleets unsafer. No surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, as I've gotten deeper and deeper into the industry, one thing that yep. I guess I recognized prior to getting into trucking, but now yep. is just in the forefront is how many billboards commercials yep. of yep. just, uh, there's actually a certification for lawyers for semi-truck accidents. And it's, <laughs> you know, yeah. as a driver, that's scary because it's like, right. Right. these people are coming after me and I need to do everything right. I can to be prepared. Right. Um, right. But I guess kind of, I, I've read some of your work. I, I appreciate some of the stuff yeah. that you've put out. And one thing that I was really intrigued about, and, you know, I, I from a physical therapy side, I think the human body is a complex mm -hmm. and multifaceted um, organism yeah. or whatever you want to describe it. And, you know, something that you've talked about is sleep stealers and mm. talking about the different uh, dynamics mm. and uh, factors that affect someone's yep. sleep. Could yep. you could you talk on that yeah. for a little bit? Yeah, so, so we'll start with a couple of the ones that people self-medicate with, like alcohol and caffeine. Like there, there are a couple of uh, easy ones to start with. Alcohol is a muscle relaxant. So a lot of people say, oh, I, I need to take a couple of beers or a glass of wine to fall asleep, and it doesn't affect my sleep. Well, the reality is it does. When you wear a polysomnograph to look at your brainwave activity, uh, uh, such as what you'd wear during a sleep study where your scalp's wired up with all these electrodes. It measures brainwave activity that approximates a different sleep architecture. What you will find is that for the first three hours, your sleep will be fairly normal if you've had four or five beers, but the back end of the sleep, it's destroyed. Very little deep sleep, very little REM sleep. That's why you wake up with a, you know, a slight hangover headache, and then you've got to self-medicate again, and you're back on the treadmill. And it's this vicious cycle you get in. So alcohol, whilst it's relaxant, relaxant uh, it also brings on, because it relaxes your throat muscles, it brings on the probability of sleep apnea events, because it relaxes the soft palate in the back of the throat, and that slides back down and blocks off your airways. So it, it, it destroys the back end of your sleep. You don't get as much good quality sleep. Similar thing with caffeine, although caffeine's a little bit different in that it's because it's a stimulant. Um, what it's got a half life of six hours. So you know, to fall asleep at say ten o'clock at night, I'll give you an analogy that the sleep gate has got to open. And the way the sleep gate open is you get tired enough, and and melatonin kicks in after sunrise, uh, sunset, and caffeine wears off. So if you have caffeine within six hours of sleep, that sleep gate won't open because they're still trying to keep you awake. So because it's got a half-life of six hours, I always say to people, don't drink caffeine past 3 a.m. or 3 p.m. Yeah. That's an that's a easy rule. And that'll allow the sleep gate to open. So there's two of the big sleep stealers. Nicotine has a similar effect, but they're the ones that I watch more than anything because I see drivers have access to those more than anything. Of course, there's caffeine in soda to a, to a smaller degree. So all of those sodas that are caffeinated, all of that, you know, the the you know, the high potency caffeine drinks, the, the energy drinks you're taking, especially the ones with sugar, it's just a roller coaster. So I try and back off all of those water. If you've got the need to have hand to mouth habit of, you know, doing something, um, you know, make good choices with things like water or low carb drinks. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, 
I've posted because we talk about ca- I've talked about caffeine and just educating yeah. on that. And I, I really like that uh, yeah. um, 3 p.m., 3 a.m., yeah. depending yeah. on the shift you're working. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I get comments from drivers that say, oh, 3 p.m. That's a joke. I, I'm drinking. I can drink caffeine yeah. and go right to yeah. bed. And so no. would your would your thought yeah. be they're already sleep deprived and there are there there's OK. So again, when you look at their sleep architecture with the scalp electrodes of someone that drinks caffeine, it's like the teeth on a saw. They're always waking up. Now they don't remember this, right? So it's sleep, wake, sleep, wake, sleep, wake, sleep, wake. You're tossing and turning. Your quality of sleep is absolutely awful. Um, you don't get uh, REM sleep or deep sleep to the degree that you would if you weren't drinking caffeine. So, so even if you think, oh, it doesn't affect me, it's affecting you. You just don't realize it. You don't remember it. And because you wake up not feeling fully rested, um, then you've got to self-caffeinate. You've got to caffeinate again. Now, th- there are exceptions, right? There are some people that have a very high or very high tolerance to caffeine, right? They're very rare. Generally, if you're taking, if you're drinking too much caffeine, it's affecting your sleep. For sure. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you've, you've thrown out REM sleep, you've thrown out, I think whenever uh, everyone, anyone's thinking yeah. about sleep, they, the fancy term of circadian rhythm. And I've heard you talk right. on the 90, 90 minute or an hour and a half sleep cycle. How does that contribute to driver yeah. sleep? So this is one of the keys um, to good quality sleep because I've, I teach drivers to get better quality sleep from less hours in the bunk. And that doesn't sound intuitive at all. Because we all think sleep is linear, more is better. No, that's not the case. More is actually worse in a lot of cases. So but we sleep in one of the, we have a circadian rhythm, which is a daily sleep pattern that is set by primarily the rising and setting of the sun, the sunlight, blue light in particular at a certain frequency. So that determines when we wake and sleep. So you go to bed at night in a normal way. It takes 20 minutes to fall asleep, maybe less. And what, what happens is if I could describe the, the sleep cycle, it's about an hour and a half. You drift off into light sleep, deep sleep. Uh, sometimes you have these involuntary movements where your body sort of jerks and you and you sort of, you know, you're not sure. That's the in-between phase where the body disconnects. So light sleep, uh, dr- you know, sort of drowsy. Do I read a book or not? Then you drift off a bit further and you get really tired and then you just fall asleep and you don't remember it. Right. And, and that's deep sleep. That's about 75 minutes at about the 75 minute mark. Your, your, your brain body starts to wake up, your brain wakes up and you finish with a dream. So a sleep cycle is made up of, uh, you know, drowsy, light sleep, deep sleep dream. And the difference between deep sleep is a very different, process it it deals with the physical fatigue in deep sleep you're tossing and turning but you're you're, you are unconscious you are dead to the world literally because the brain is unconscious human growth hormones being produced into the body that's why your body's tossing and turning it's repairing your skin hair muscles the physical fatigue as you come back through light sleep your, your brain waves start to increase in frequency and it's called rapid eye movement because your eyes are darting back and forward essentially what happens is your brain puts all of your muscles to sleep except your eyes and your heart so you don't act out your dreams so you're in a state of paralysis so it's the opposite of what people think people think when they dream they're moving around no when you're dreaming you are in a state of paralysis right and you can, when you wear wristwatch actographs for sleep studies, there's no movement in a dream, but in deep sleep, you're tossing and turning. So think about deep sleep fixes the fatigue of the body below the neck. REM sleep fixes the fatigue in your head, memory, mood, emotion, stress, gets rid of all of that. So that's a sleep cycle. It's an hour and a half. And then you put five or six of those together. It's that simple. So you sleep in blocks of an hour and a half. And most of you out there will be saying, you know, if you think about this, you wake every hour and a half, roughly, right? So you'll go to sleep, drift off, wake up, especially as you get older, past about age 45, you start to wake more frequently during the night. And so you have hour and a half, wake up, drift off again, hour and a half, drift off. So you'll sleep in blocks of an hour and a half, one and a half, three, four and a half, six. So six hours is four sleep cycles. So what I teach drivers to do is don't keep count sleep in hours, count it in cycles, because it's the cycle that gives you the quality. Now, let me ask you this, Mark. Have you ever had a one-hour nap and woken up feeling worse? Yeah, yeah, you feel, right. yeah, because you're not, you're waking up right in that deep sleep cycle. Right. So you wake up with what's called sleep inertia. 
And if, but if you set your alarm clock for an hour and a half, you'd be waking up with your brains already dreaming and buzzing with electricity and you just go into gear and you're off and running. So you, you feel fine. But if you wake at an hour, you wake with sleep inertia. And here's why it's a critical number for truckers. The more sleep deprived you are, the more severe the inertia. It's harder to kick, right? You feel like sleep was a waste of time. It wasn't restorative. You're frustrated. You're now 60 miles where you, behind where you should have been. But there's a whole lot of nasty things that happen at the one hour mark. It's the most common number I hear drivers say on the, on the CB radio. And I said, make it an hour and a half. Pull up for an hour and a half. Right? And then you'll feel fine. So napping is 20 to 30 minutes before you drift into deep sleep or an hour and a half. That's how okay, you That's what I was going to ask. What is yeah. that cap yeah. where yeah. you can sleep yeah. 20 to 30 minutes? You're good. You're still refreshed, uh, yeah. more refreshed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now the 20 to 30, the brain waves in that 20 to 30 minute recharge the part of the brain that deals with vigilance, cognition, alertness, right? So that's, that's, that's why a short nap makes you feel great but don't go past 30 minutes. Some people it's 10, um, but, so, but a short nap is, is a really powerful substitute for that cup of coffee at 6 a.m. Yeah. Because you yeah. didn't drink at 3 a.m. So, so that's kind of the napping sleep cycles. Um, so that's why six hours is better than seven mm-hmm. because at seven, you're in the middle of the fifth sleep cycle, but seven and a half is better than seven. So I, I teach drivers to set their alarm clocks for multiples of an hour and a half. One and a half, three, four and a half, six, seven and a half, nine. Gotcha. That's yeah, it. no, and that makes sense, especially when you break down how a sleep cycle goes and, right. you know, what yeah. states you're in and kind of as we're going towards, cause I respect your time. I don't want to, I, I think this could be a three yeah. hour discussion, yeah, it but, could be. you know, I, I think when, especially when I'm talking to a lot of drivers about exercise and nutrition, one of the right. things that I'm uh, not even from a physical, like I'm struggling to do this, but from a mental perspective of just some of the drivers have a mindset of I'm screwed because I'm a driver and right. I can't do anything right. about it. And have you seen that type of mindset or just that, mm-hmm. well, I'm a driver. I can't do anything about it. I'm not right. even going to think about it when it comes to sleep. It's very common because you'll talk to drivers about sleep and they'll say, well, you don't know my spouse. Or you don't know my boss. You should come and talk to my company. And that's why I only do sleep classes if the CEO is involved. Because it's no good me teaching drivers how to sleep and their dis- dispatcher or driver manager is driving them into the ground. Or the, or the company is just not interested in their well-being because they have a high turnover rate. So in isolation, drivers feel helpful, helpless when it comes to this. Now, when you talk to management, they think driver fatigue is a driver problem. Wrong. Completely wrong. The driver schedule is is a result of how the company runs their business, right? Yeah. So if you were if you were really clever, and this is where some fleets are working towards, if you design biocompatible schedules, and here's a revolutionary thought: what if you design the schedule of the driver around his preferred sleep pattern, and built the appointment time for the pickup and load around all of that? I wonder how much safer we'd all be. And of course. It's the last thing companies do right now. Now, I've done biocompatible scheduling in, in sleeper teams with a lot of success. So think about, you know, think about some teams that arbitrarily put drivers together based on their music or smoking preference. But what if you put drivers together based on their sleep personality? What if I put two night owls in the same truck? What have I got? Two drivers that want to sleep at the same time. Yeah. yeah. But what if I put a morning lark and a night owl in the truck, I've got opposite sleep patterns. And lo and behold, you get high mileage, high productivity, low turnover, happy drivers. They're not laying in the bunk with one eye awake because they're worried, right? So biocompatible scheduling is actually a really clever way to design a trucking business schedule around the sleep pattern because we all ignore it. We just think the 10 hour break is all a driver needs. No, it's the 10 hour break at the right time of the day that suits their sleep pattern. Right. And, the, and the other huge mistake fleets make, probably the number one mistake, is they start the driver's work day at a different time every day. Mm-hmm. It's the biggest mistake they make. Because if you have a different start time every day, by default, you have a different sleep pattern every day. And that leads to all sorts of unhealthy outcomes that affects your world in terms of driver health, nutrition, diet, exercise. Um, accidents come out of it, poor customer service, they're late. So if companies, a lot of companies say to me, what's the one thing we could do? What's an easy, easy, low hanging fruit? 
just start your drivers at the same time every day. Yeah. Because what that means is they'll sleep at the same time every day. The sleep block's the same because the human body has an inbuilt drive for sleep, uh, anchor sleep, same time, same place every day. We're creatures of habit. So if they did that one thing, life would be so much easier for a lot of drivers and companies. Yeah, and I think it goes back to uh, you've got a you've got a group of companies that are thinking like that and having that right, mindset right, of let's let's right. let's build this and have a higher quality of life for our drivers and right, hopefully that right. increases retention, increased safety, all these other things. Right. And then you've got another group of companies where you know, the mindset is we already have a hundred percent turnover, you know, why, yeah. why, you know, we, and, and I think you're going to yeah. see that play out uh, in the, in the long run of the companies who care and um, yeah. they're going to win. Uh, and and I think. Some, yeah. I've got some stats that can, you know, prove this. We published a study on this when I was uh, working for a large telematics firm. I trained half of the truck drivers in a 3000 truck fleet in how to sleep. The control group was just taught how to be compliant with e-logs. So, one group was compliant to e-logs. My group was compliant and I taught them how to sleep, how to get six hours sleep every 24, two periods of night sleep every seven, naps strategically timed throughout the day, et cetera, et cetera. So my group had one rollover in six months. The control group had 14, one four, wow. which was the normal rollover rate for the company over that period for the half the company. My drivers were 30% less likely to quit and the accident cost was about 80% lower because they weren't having the severity. They weren't running off the road crashing. So they were more on time, had lower accident cost, more likely to stay. And of course, you can back into all of that from the physiology of sleep because well-rested drivers make more miles. They feel better. They're happier. They think better. They make better choices. So you've got to start with, you know, it's like diesel goes in the tank for the engine. What goes in the brain? To, to maximize vigilance and cognition and an attention and, and just alertness. It's sleep. And that's, that's yeah. why it's so important. Yeah. And I, I completely agree. And, you know, I think we, I always like when I bring a guest on here to end the podcast and you kind of gave one yeah. Yeah. Um, actual advice for fleets yeah. and carriers, yeah. but if you yeah. were to give, you know, uh, if it's low hanging fruit or just one yeah. piece or two pieces of advice yeah. for the driver, what would you, yeah. what would you tell them? I would say to them, you can be 100% compliant to hours of service and sound asleep at the wheel at the same time. Okay. Don't fool yeah. yourself. Don't yeah. fool yourself into thinking being compliant to unsafe regulations makes you safer. It doesn't, it never has, and it never will. So that's why you've, so for companies that really want to get their arms around this, they've got to could be go over and above what the government's asking them to do. Just meeting the government standards is sort of table stakes these days. You've got to go over and above. You've got to implement all sorts of programs. You've got to put a really big safety net around your drivers in all sorts of ways because this is a really hard job. It's, it's not the driving. The steering piece is really easy. I could teach anyone to steer a truck. Driving a truck, much more different because you've got to deal with the stresses of everything around you. And unless you're well-rested, those stresses become debilitating. It forces you out of the industry and you quit. And that's why the turnover rate is so high at the 90-day mark because that's how long it takes for cumulative fatigue to grind you into the ground. After a lifetime of sleeping at night, suddenly you're an over the road trucker and sleep is a luxury. And after 90 days, you know what you say, you know what, this is too hard. I can't do this. I hate the color of the truck. That's the wrong reason to quit, but that's what happens. You become irrational. So I would just say to people go over and you've got to do a lot more than just being compliant. If you really want to address safety. Yeah. And we're going to have to have you back on the podcast and talk a little bit. Cause I, I also wanted to, uh, you know, get in with the, how sleep goes with exercise and eating healthy and being fit yep. to drive and all of that. And we're going to have to talk yep. about that next time you're on. And I yep. really appreciate this conversation and, uh, yep. yeah, everyone listening, focus on your sleep. You, yeah. you got a great education right here. There's Dean's got a lot of great, uh, options. If, uh, I'll put something in the show notes to direct yeah. towards his LinkedIn and some of the other social medias. And, um, yeah. you know, this is not only for you, but it's for your family. It's for, you know, uh, everyone else on the road with you. And, um, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's worth the uh, extra little effort to, to make your sleep a priority in your life. Uh, so thank yeah. you so much for listening. And uh, Dean, thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Chicken, truck, and big wheels, they're humming. High rate of fuel consumption, missing mama, needing love, and rolling with a way of sound. Running like a 
southern shaker. I don't need no 40 acres to turn this rig around. I'm jacked up like a Chevy, but ain't heading to the levee. Lord have mercy sakes so why? On this high step and double clutching, gear jamming, chicken trucking on snow. 